Hi, I'm Tim Wolf from Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. If you love what you see here, everything is for sale. We're waking up with watches, and to inquire, reach out to me, T Masso at thewatchbox.com. I have pricing information, extra photos if you want them, and details of boxes, papers, and accessories. And if you're looking to sell or trade, we are always looking to build inventory. We pay cash, we pay fast, no upper limit on value paid. We will buy an entire collection to buy, trade, or sell. Reach out to me, T Masso at thewatchbox.com for pricing. So let's start off with a watch that I think is one of the most attractive versions of the current generation Datejust. 36 millimeters in stainless steel. This is reference 126200. A lot of unconventional elements here. So it's stainless steel, 36 millimeters. It has a dark rhodium sunburst dial. And this is the Wimbledon style dial with the minimal luminescence and the lacquered numerals. You can see it's got the little crown at six o'clock between Swiss and made, indicative of the latest generation. We have a domed bezel here with a Jubilee bracelet. And when you combine the Wimbledon dial with the domed bezel and the Jubilee bracelet, you get a very unusual permutation of optional Rolex features that makes this an uncommon look for a Rolex watch, which is really the best of both worlds. You get the unimpeachable quality and heritage of Rolex, but you also get a little bit of individuality, something that's not always available if you're going after a conventional sub GMT or Daytona. Now, the Jubilee bracelet actually wears quite nicely. The watch on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist is perfectly fit, a great size. It'll easily dive underneath the cuff. The Jubilee is now so robust with solid links uh, that you can easily wear it as a sports bracelet. You can also see the many gaps between the small links. It actually vents better than the larger link oyster sports bracelet. Now we have a clasp right here with a clicking lift lock system. You lift it to unlock it. You have the easy link five millimeter tool free adjustment system built in. You have a hundred meters of water resistance, a little bit of luminescence with the hand and the index at nine o'clock. Chronometer certification, Quick set, hacking second, 70 hours of power reserve, a very impressive little watch. But let's say you want a sportier take on the Datejust. Well, we've got this. Right here, you're looking at a Datejust 41 with Oyster bracelets. Now we've got the sports style bracelet and a fully luminescent dial. Now this one's also all steel construction. This is 126300. Let's take a look at the loom here. You can see the latest generation Rolex chromolite blue loom, absolutely no shortage. Now, if we go back to the Wimbledon dial from just a moment ago, you can see, uh, though the watch is sporty and, in fact, named after a sporting event, it is not the best loomed of Rolex dials. I will say this, though. Technically speaking, the two are equivalent, as here we have a decent amount of shock resistance, anti-magnetism, 100-meter water resistance, the 70-hour power reserve, all of that, and the chronometer certification. It's a bigger watch, though. From end link to end link across the wrist, it's about 51.2 millimeters, so it's a big piece. And you're going to need a wrist of at least 15 centimeters circumference to wear this. Though you could see it's only 12.2 millimeters thick, so it's fairly thin, easily slides underneath the cuff. And in fact, you could see it sliding underneath my cuff right here. So this watch is a little bit less of a unisex option than the 36. Now, if you want something that's even less of a unisex option, the big baller, the original Datejust 2. Now, this watch came out in 2009 and it was made through 2015. This is the the reference 116300. It's got a lovely dial with the rarely seen radially arrayed lavender numerals. We'll do a quick loom shot right here so you get a better sense of the watch. You can see that the hands and the numerals are actually a differential luminescent color, which is a lot of fun and unexpected. Now, the watch here has a caliber called the 3136, so not a whole lot different between this and the 3135, though there is a use of Paraflex Rolex in-house shock protection springs rather than Kith, and here we have a larger date wheel because it is a larger dial. We have a silver sunburst dial, 48 hour power reserve, chronometer certification, 100 meter water resistance. Okay, so you've seen Rolex, you've seen the options, starting with small, working our way all the way up to extra large, and this is a bigger watch across the wrist, make no mistake, than the Datejust 41. They might be the same diameter, but in terms of actual size across the wrist, this one is going to be considerably broader. All right. Richard Meal, from bracelets to straps, and a watch that came out in 2004, and this was the first automatic RM. It's a surprisingly easy to wear watch. That's always been a quality of Richard Mille tonneau cases, but this watch is particularly compact, being just 38 millimeters across and 45 millimeters from lug to lug. Now, when I throw it on the wrist, and I'll do so right now, it's a comfortable watch. It wears better than the later and larger RM10, and you can really see that if you're gonna wear this watch on a wrist, 
my size. The RM5 really is the way to go. The watch is surprisingly thin in profile, just about 12 millimeters, which is surprising given that if you just look at it, it appears sheer and chunky. It's really not. It's very comfortable. It sits well, and you can see from this down the barrel shot that there's plenty of clearance on each side. I don't consider the RM10 a unisex option. I do consider the RM5 to be a watch for man or woman, or for those who prefer just traditional sizes. Uh, this is a watch that is in a lot of ways a timepiece born of the popularity of Franck Muller's tonneau cases in the 90s. RM was established in 1999. It marketed its first watches in 2001. And the basic idea was to take what worked with Franck Muller, then the most popular and successful independent watch brand in history, make it a bit more modern and sports oriented, and then sell that as a Richard meal. Now, of course, RM has gone so far beyond that original concept. And you can see that the watch uh, has quite a bit to recommend it in its own right. First, there's the open dial, which is beautifully loomed. You can see that there's a carbon fiber flange outboard that bears the luminescent indices. We have a little date window. There's a quick set and hacking seconds. The movement is made of grade five titanium, so it's super light. Flip it all over, automatic winding. It has variable inertia masses on the rotor itself. These are actually variable polar moment masses. Move them in or out to change the winding efficiency. There's a free sprung architecture to make the movement more shock tolerant. Uh, you can uh, just barely see the Vauche star on the base plate. Vauche made the movement for Richard Mill. The little V on the case is Valjeanne, which is a stakeholder in RM and their case maker over the years. Uh, you can see that it's basically a two barrel movement for a nice even torque release. You don't get the big fluctuations in amplitude you get with a single barrel. 55 hour power reserve and you have these little shock absorbers at the four corners, little rubber donuts that help the movement to join to the case in a fashion that's not rigid. So if you shake the watch or concuss it, it has a better ability to shake off that shake. All right. Quick note, people love these clasps. They're made by GNF Chatelain. They are leaf spring deployant, and you can see double deployant. There's a spring that pops it open and closes it shut, and it's pretty resolute in both directions. So it's a wonderful design uh, that Richard Mille uses on most of its models, and it is a wonderful clasp for a wonderful watch. Uh, just keep in mind, you buy an RM for the idea behind it, uh, the sportiness of the style, the rarity of the watches, uh, the lifestyle that RM himself, Richard Mille, projects. This is not necessarily the watch you buy if you want the ultimate in haute horlogerie finishing, but we have options for that. Such as Blancpain. Now this is a brand that actually has its own tie to independent watchmaking, as this movement Caliber 23, launched in 1989, and it was designed with the assistance of Vincent Calabrese. Now this is the Caliber 23 Tourbillon, and it is a masterpiece. The watch is remarkably compact at just 34 millimeters in diameter, 7.8 millimeters thick. You can see here in yellow gold, the watch includes an eight day manual wine power reserve with a power reserve indicator, a date and a flying tourbillon with no upper bridge to block your view. It beats way at 21.6. It is a one minute tourbillon. And you can see that the actual tourbillon structure is remarkably black polished right down to the escape wheel. You can see that the edge of this upper bridge, or I guess you would call it the upper cage, because properly speaking, this is a flying tourbillon. There is no upper bridge to block your view, but it has that wonderful beveling on its edge, which you can see to advantage from this angle. You can also see there's a sharp outward angle here and here, as there are two points on the tourbillon cage. Flip it all over, you can see it features the pre-1995, or at least pre late 1995, as there was a mid-year transition, uh, the old Helvetic head rather than the diamond-shaped dog's head. Uh, this watch was a real landmark piece, a uh, statement that Blancpain was back in earnest in Haute Horlogerie, and it's one of the reasons why this brand was often named alongside Vacheron, AP, and of course, Patek Philippe in the 90s as sort of like the fourth member of the Holy Trinity before Longa had claimed that status. It was really Blancpain due to watches like this uh, that appeared to be on the rise. And while the company itself has had ups and downs, there's never been any doubt about the quality of the watches. It's almost like a hidden gem within the Swatch Group labyrinth. Everything Blancpain made then and now is beautiful. And that includes sports watches.
This is a model launched in 2013, 43 millimeters in steel. It's the reference 5050 fathoms bathyscaphe. It's a little bit more of an explicitly vintage inflected watch than the more modern 5015. When I talk about the fine stuff that Blancpain does today, I mean, you get sports watches with movements like this. This is caliber 1315, three main spring barrels, five days of power reserve. There are three separate finishes on the rotor alone. You can see the anglage on the edge of the bridges is a mile wide, uh, as good as Roger Dubuis at its peak back when it was doing the fattest anglage this side of Philippe Dufour. Now it's six position adjusted, it's free sprung, it has an anti-magnetic silicon hairspring, and these movements are known to keep time to within one second a day. You'll note that there's spectacular solarization, for example, on the ratchet wheel. You can also see that all the wheels feature satination, and there's an uncommon sort of spiral graining across the bridges rather than Cote de Genève, an unconventional but welcome aesthetic for a watch that's very modern in its engineering but very traditional in its style. Uh, traditional Geneva waves on a movement like this just would look out of place. Now, the watch is 300 meters water resistant. Let's hear the bezel. It's very sharp, very positive and it has 120 click action. There's a ceramic insert on the bezel top. The dial features applique indices and a gray anthracite sunburst. We have a hybrid of baton and syringe style hands and plenty of luminescence, no doubt. The watch has a screw down big crown without guards, reminiscent of late 1950s and early 1960s 50 fathom style. It's on this lovely desert camo style sailcloth strap. So here we have this wonderful khaki colored sailcloth strap and it's a perfect match for the watch to be honest. It's very in character. The watch isn't as thick as you might think. As you can see it slides underneath the cuff. It's under 14 millimeters thick and it's under 50 millimeters across the wrist from lug to lug. So these are really great pieces. If you like the idea of something along the lines of an Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Offshore Diver uh, but you want to pay less money and get what I believe to be finer finishing and a higher mechanical specification, uh, this is a great option. You're not going to find too many five-day power reserve divers out there, and they really thought of everything as the underside of the sailcloth strap is coated with rubber to avoid abrasion of the skin or aggression against the skin. Really, this watch is the complete package and as good as it gets in high luxury divers. Well, let's say you want an ultra-luxury sports watch. Well, then you want this. This is the Grubel 4C Balancier S, so the Balancier Sport Titanium. The watch is nominally 43 millimeters in diameter, but you have to think of it as being a little bit more compact than that. The watch is only about 45 millimeters from end to end, so that's the total distance across the wrist from literally bezel to bezel. So being only 45 millimeters from lug to lug, or at least case end to case end, you can see it's nowhere near the edge of my wrist. In grade 5 titanium, the watch is feather light, and what really makes this one special is that it also has a grade 5 titanium movement. So the inside as well as the outside of the watch being made of titanium, it really has a feel of almost a toy on the wrist. And I mean that in the endearing sense. Now you can see this is one of eight. It is a true rarity, entirely handmade. There's a sticker over the case back which somewhat mutes the quality of the bright polish, but you can see it to good advantage. Absolutely no expense is spared. We have uh, anglage on the edge of these bridges, a raised mirror polished channel around the edge, and then a media blasted interior. The little numbering plate, one of eight, is made of white gold. The pivots sit inside golden chiton, a nod to the pocket watch era of watchmaking in La Chaux de Fonds, where Grubel 4C is based, and they make about 100 to 150 watches a year. All of this is water resistant to over 100 meters, and the watch features two stacked barrels with a manual winding system that has 72 hours of power reserve and a power reserve indicator. There's a large arcing bridge for the motion works, and when the watch is being adjusted, you can actually see the motion works turning and the operation of the mechanism that sets the hands. We have an enormous free sprung balance with recessed bolts to improve aerodynamics. Those bolts move in and out to change the polar moment or turning force, and that's how this rugged, free-sprung sports watch architecture is regulated. There's a very small sub-seconds display, and then we've got a overcoil hairspring bent by hand, so no matter what position the watch is in on the wrist, the hairspring will develop concentrically, and the watch will keep even time. Do a quick loom shot right here. Uh, this watch, oops, this watch has luminescence. Of course, it's the red version of Super Luminova, so not the brightest, but you do get nighttime vision that is sufficient to tell the time. This is how high horology, and I mean ultra haute de gamme, the very apex of the market, does a sports watch.
but let's say you want to discuss more affordable options. Well, I have two of them right here. Uh, Hajime Asoka is a wonderful watchmaker. Mr. Asayoka is absolutely the foremost Japanese watchmaker in design terms. Uh, he's known on the mechanical side for being a master with CNC, but in 2018, he created design as a calling card with the Corono Tokyo sub-brand. Now, the idea here is to do sort of what Max Booster did with the Mad One, but first the Mad One came after this. Second, the Mad One is only available to friends of the brand, whereas these are available in limited runs uh, to international Japanese domestic market and sometimes special interest audiences. And I'll explain what I mean. Uh, what we have right here is the Seije, which is a special edition of 500 pieces that was actually developed for female watch buyers, and that caused a little bit of controversy, particularly because initially they had a strange way of selling them to women. Um, I won't go into that, I'll just say that 37 millimeters in stainless steel, the CJ is a truly attractive watch, and whereas this color dial, almost a celadon blue, would have been considered effeminate at a time, I think after the year of the Tiffany dial Nautilus and Oyster Perpetual, we can safely conclude that this is equally attractive to men. Now the 37 millimeter steel case is easily wearable, I would wear it, as you can see it's almost the exact same color as my sleeve, so uh, even the white strap I like, I'm a formerly out of Miami, that's where Watch You Want was based, and this sort of white strap, Tiffany blue dial combo would have been absolutely perfect, and I would even go so far as to say the Art Deco accents, the dial, would have looked fantastic on the Art Deco strip at Miami Beach. Now, there are a lot of mid-20th century design elements here, but for the most part, this is a completely original effort. It's uh, powered by a Miyota movement, which is made in Japan, automatic winding, it's got a 42 hour power reserve, it does have hacking or stop seconds, and the watch is nicely made and compact in dimensions. The case is attractive, a very organic, fluid, blended lug profiles, a vintage, unsigned, domed style crown, and it does feature a sapphire. So while the price was affordable, uh, the watch is definitely a high quality mechanical timepiece that will last a lifetime with proper care. So though this was a fashion first effort by Hajime Asayoka, it is very much a luxury watch in the sense that we use the term. Now, this is the Chronograph 2. So the Chrono Tokyo Chronograph 2, it followed the Chronograph 1. This is a limited edition of uh, 500 pieces that is absolutely attractive in every regard. 38 millimeters in diameter in stainless steel, and it uses a couple of elements that endear it to me. First, you can see the use of copper tones on the dial. We have little polished cabochon, which are uh, representative of the hours, and then we have polished chapter rings for the sub-registers, which include seconds and chronograph minutes. Now, the hands are lovely. They are a little bit contrasting in style. One is a leaf-style hand. The other is, is almost a spade style. It's very difficult uh, to pin down exactly what that shape would be called, but it's almost a combination of a spade style and a syringe profile, and you can see that it has been rolled so that there's no uh, parallax error when viewing the hand. Now, what's important here is that you get a movement inside the Seiko NE86 that is a vertical clutch, automatic winding, 45-hour power reserve, Japanese-made chronograph movement that has both hacking seconds and a quick set for the date. So you get all the functionality you could want in a watch that's 38 millimeters diameter and quite attractive from any angle. This is a design first effort. There's no getting around that. But as with the CJ, this is a watch that you could absolutely consider a lifelong piece as it is serviceable, critically. A mechanical watch that is lifetime serviceable whether or not 80 years from now, Mr. Asayoka is still running his brand. Uh, this watch will be serviceable by any watchmaker who knows Seiko. Sticking with our affordable options here, this is not the watch you think it is. Uh, back in 2020, Revolution Magazine and Zenith reissued the A3818, better nicknamed 
CoverGirl. So the nickname CoverGirl is the one that, that people associate with this watch, which properly speaking came out in 1971 as the A3818. Now that original watch was a limited run in steel. This is a second limited run that is the CoverGirl Airweight in grade 5 titanium. This is a 250 piece run and it is super light. It lives up to its name. It has the historically inspired ladder style bracelet. It features a case that is 37 millimeters in diameter and wonderfully 70s with its lapping machine radial grain on the top and a tonneau profile when viewed from the side. You can see that the dial features the so-called sawtooth uh, seconds and seconds fractions track. So we can track the one-tenth of a second accuracy of the caliber 400 El Primero in here. Now if you look outboard you can see that it is a pulsation scale and it is a base 15. So the way, this, the way this works is that it is both tachymeter and pulsation scale. So you start it up while holding your patient's pulse. You count to 15 and when you stop Let's say you count 15 right there, you stop, that is 150 beats per minute. So that is how that works. Now, the watch, of course, is well loomed as it is a modern timepiece. This is no tritium dial. And the entirety of the dial is luminescent. It is visually spectacular, but also quite practical, as you can easily read the time at a glance. Now, flipping it over, you can see that they even did the clasp in a vintage style. The watch is 50 meters water resistant, powered by an El Primero caliber 400, so bi directional automatic winding, 50 hour power reserve. It is a column wheel chronograph. You can see the column wheel in action there, and it beats away at 36,000 vibrations per hour, or effectively, 10 beats per second. Now, the watch is gorgeous. It is easy to wear, and we've been through an episode of watches that could uh, be called unisex, and that's certainly what we have right here, is this watch wears so short across the wrist. You can see from the top, the lugs aren't even approaching the edge of my wrist. I've got so much clearance on both sides. There's absolutely no challenge, and it's flat enough at 12.9 millimeters thick to fit underneath my wrist. It really is air weight. If you like the idea of advanced materials, the scratch resistance of grade 5 of titanium compared to steel, the effortless comfort of a watch that seems to float in the hand and on the wrist. That's exactly what's being offered here. And it even has a dial with a lovely, almost iridescent blue and a vertical graining to it that's both vintage evocative and hyper modern at the same time. The use of a red lacquered seconds hand here is sublime. And you can see that even these sub registers feature wonderfully evocative uh, patterns from the past. Now, this is a blast from the past, but maybe not in the way you think. The original B.E.R. was issued in 1940 by the Luftwaffe, but in 2002, IWC revived the style in a 46-millimeter package, which was actually a downsized from the 55-millimeter World War II original. Well, what you see right here is the Big Pilot Big Date Edition 150 Years. It is part of the 2018 150-year Jubilee celebration, so they made 150, as you see it right here. The watch is 46.2mm millimeters in stainless steel and it has a blue lacquer dial that was applied by hand in up to 12 different applications of blue lacquer and clear coat to create that wonderful enamel-like effect that's designed to reference the original IWC enamel dial pocket watches of the late 1860s and 1870s. So this one differs quite a bit from the current IWC Big Pilots watch. The use of small seconds and a big date gives the watch an unusual appearance, and perhaps it's fitting that a big pilot's watch should have a big date. With the small date, it was a bit incongruous. And also, you get a little bit of the flavor of those 19th century IWC Paul Weber digital display watches that were also celebrated in 2018 at the Jubilee. Now, the watch has plenty of luminescence. That's not lacking here. You can easily read the time. And you can see that this is the full fat big pilot's watch, fully sized and designed mind for a mighty wrist. I'll throw it on my wrist so you at least have some sense of scale, but truth be told, I think you need at least a 17 centimeter circumference wrist to wear a full-sized 46 millimeter big pilot. The watch is large. Could I wear it? Sure. Should I wear it? 
that's a matter of taste. Some folks with smaller wrists just dig the look, and the look is imposing and impressive. The watch is also not as thick as you think at about 15.3 millimeters. The movement is impressive, but you don't see much of it. Uh, this is a IWC manual wind, eight day in-house caliber. Uh, the watch features a small power reserve indicator on the reverse side. Everything else is surrounded by a soft iron cage that provides anti-magnetic properties. And with a screw down crown, it is 60 meters water resistant, so surface swimmable. You get a full deploying clasp, as you can see right here, to protect your investment against accidental droppage. And the crown itself is over 10 millimeters in diameter. It's 10.8. It's almost 11 millimeters in diameter. This is a big pilot's watch. It's also technically refined with chronometer style five position adjustment, a free sprung balance architecture, and a handmade Breguet overcoil hairspring. Quick set date and hacking seconds, a lot to love. Jumping back to our independent watch brands, we have a couple of them that are a lot of fun. And MBNF is always one of the best. Back in 2015, Max launched his 10th anniversary watch. They made four different examples in British Racing Green, Ferrari Red, Lotus Black, and Bugatti Blue, or French Racing Blue. What we have right here is Ferrari Red. Now, they made 20 like you see it here. The watch is a combination of stainless steel and grade 5 titanium. It's about 45 millimeters wide and about 47 millimeters long. The watch is a driver's watch, which you might have gathered from the names of the color scheme, but it features a jumping hour display system. That is a wonderful little piece of theater. There are actually optical tricks being played here as a set of lenses are redirecting the image of the hour and minute discs which actually lay flat and flush this they're in this plane so the display is in this plane but the discs actually sit flat here and then optics bend the image so you can see it the idea is that this watch will be on your wrist and as you're driving and you have your hand on the steering wheel just like that, you can easily glance the time. That's the idea. It's very similar to 1970s, quote, driver's style watches like the Amita Digitrend, which Max has often cited as one of the inspirations for several of the watches he's made. It uses a proprietary strap that features a combination of red textile and black leather with a contrasting white stitch. And it is an automatic winder with a Salida SW300 base, 42 hour power reserve. And as you can see, a couple of different finishes here as we have polish, we we have media blasting, and then we have satination. There is a lot of nuance right here. You even have the imagery that, frankly, reminds me of nothing so much as uh, heat sinks or even intercoolers on high-performance engines, and that is exactly the idea that Max had with this 20-piece limited edition watch. Now, what we have here is a serious collectible. You might say, well, that's a longer one. I've seen them. Well, so have I, but you will rarely see them like this with solid case back. They were only made like this from 1994 through the very beginning of 1996. And this is the reference 101005, 38.5 millimeters in platinum with sterling silver dial. It is an exceptionally rare platinum solid case back longer one. These are hugely sought for their rarity and their traditional Teutonic modesty. The idea back then was that you trusted in your watchmaker to give you the highest standard of finish. It was a matter of integrity that they would provide it. They did not need to be immodest and put it on show. And while the logic may be difficult to understand from a 21st century perspective, in the aftermath of the fall of communism, East German watchmaking had a great pride in its survival through the communist years, but also immense cultural conservatism, born of half a century of just trying to survive. So the idea of going flamboyant with the display case back was not fully established at the time. As a result, these watches are hugely collectible. Now, mechanically, the caliber L901 is present and correct, two barrels, manual wine, three-day power reserve. We have a push-button system for the date. We have hacking seconds. We have a three-day power reserve indicator, 
a double fetter house, two mainspring barrels to maintain solid balance amplitude consistency throughout the full 72 hour power reserve. The feel of the pusher is like that of a fine column wheel chronograph, such as a datagraph. So the tactile qualities of this watch are outstanding. And I love the serif intensive font used for these numerals. Of course, that typeface was custom for the model. The hands, the frame for the date, as well as the hour indices and the numerals are all in white gold. And the watch is only 10 millimeters thick. One of the advantages of the solid case back along ones, they are thinner watches and they sit better on a smaller wrist. But with a solid platinum case back, the watch is also considerably heavier with more precious metal than you get when it's a case back sapphire. All right. What do we have here? Well, a monster launched in 2013. Difficult to describe. This is the 55-piece limited edition Erwerk EMC. Now, the EMC stands for electromechanical control or electromagnetic control, depending on who you ask at Erwerk. Now, the watch, of course, has two elements, one of which is electronic, one of which is mechanical, and the two have no impact on each other. So you can run this watch without activating the dynamo in the capacitor that runs its onboard chronoscope, and you could absolutely activate the chronoscope without the watch running. So the watch is a mechanical timepiece, and you can see this through the case back. Uh, the watch is made of a combination of steel and titanium. Here is the circuit board with the microprocessor. Uh, here is the mechanism that acts as the chronoscope that reads the rate of the balance that gives you your timing. And then we have uh, two stacked barrels for an 80-hour manual one power reserve. And then there's a fine adjustment key that you can use along with a fine adjustment scale to actually adjust the timing of your watch. There's a little push button on the bottom that allows you to pop the crown out. You'll note that also hacks the balance and stops the seconds. So that's there to make it easier to pop the crown out. You can probably see it better from this angle how that works. We have custom straps, which you'll note are hinged. And then we have a Maxon generator, which allows me to energize the capacitor inside the watch to run the chronoscope. So what happens is the mechanism reads the rate of the balance, and then through the microprocessor, it produces an easy reference on this scale to let you know how many seconds fast or slow the watch is currently operating. There's also a power reserve indicator, so you can see uh, precisely how much relative wind you have. Uh, it's, it's a relative display, as there are not marked hours, but fully wound is 80, and of course, the end of the red scale is zero. The loom is very impressive. As you can see, all the scales, including the chronoscope and the power reserve, are loomed. And yes, it does have hacking seconds. You can see that the watch wears relatively easy on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist. It's about 43.5 millimeters wide, and it's about 50 millimeters from end to end across the wrist. It is thick, but maybe not as much as you think. As you can see, it's not that much taller than my cuff. I would recommend it for a wrist as small as 15 centimeters circumference, but remember, the pivot centers are actually further inboard of the case flanks than you might think. Uh, so there's quite a bit of flexibility here. Now let's see if I wound it up enough. Now I need to wind it more. The thing about the Maxon generator is you need to wind it for each use. It has a capacitor system that doesn't hold a ton of extra charge over the long term. So using the chronoscope is pretty much on an as-needed basis. You will pull out this remarkably rugged and sharply machined piece. I mean, it really does feel like a precise instrument. I expected this to feel rather spindly and vulnerable. In fact, it feels like the bolt action of a fine rifle. It is a truly impressive machine. Uh, you probably do need to crank it for about 30 to 40 seconds, in my experience, to get three or four good runs. Runs. Let's see if I did enough here. What happens is the watch... Yep, there you go. The watch generally starts off slow and then gains momentum, so I wound it up right before the video. And then with a little bit of in-house adjustment using the mechanism, uh, you can get it right up to about zero, and it'll read bang on after 24 hours. If you like the watches that you've seen here, reach out to tmasso at thewatchbox.com for purchase and pricing details.